right? Uh, which is going to get very thin. All right, we come to the to the um, to more about worship and churches and things at the end of the third century, which we didn't get to finish last week. Um, there were bigger congregations, despite incredible persecution. Many of the sects, which were heretical, were growing weaker. A lot of people were returning to the mainstream church. The big issue was debates over whether those who returned from a sect to the mainstream church ought to be rebaptized. Worship with bigger congregations meant that uh, you needed buildings for purpose. There were more officials. The more established you get, the more people you've got to have in the bureaucracy. It's often segregation. Men and women sat in separate sections. It began with Bible reading and prayer, followed by the Eucharist, which is the term given for the communion. Um, prayers were still extemporary, but they were predictable. Uh, they weren't written down, in other words. And by that stage, they probably filed up to the table to receive communion. That was new, even though nowadays we think that's normal, but we've reverted back to a much better system where you stay in your seat and it's brought to you a much, much better system, in my view. Um, they celebrated Easter and Saints' Days. They didn't celebrate Christmas until after Constantine. Baptisms occurred at Easter. Worship, there were many variants depending on local congregations. Each town had its own bishop. Remember we said that the word episkopos for bishop meant overseer. And so in the Anglican Church we might now translate it as rector. So as I said last week, Alex is the bishop of Wyoming. That's what it meant. And many of the clergy owned farms. Now, I've done that very quickly because we were supposed to get through that last week and get up to Constantine. So now, we've gone to Constantine. Oh, okay, sorry about that. All right, that is Constantine. <coughs> um, that's his statue. Like all good tourists, he came to England to visit your cathedral. <laughs> He didn't actually, your cathedral wasn't built for another 400 years. But it was on this spot that word came that his father had died and that he was emperor of the Roman Empire, or at least of part of the Roman Empire. So it's a very important spot, and on that spot they built a statue to commemorate that event. Now when we visited York, um, they were having a a market in the grounds uh, and they were selling, amongst other things, Yorkshire wool. And so they had draped Constantine with beanies and scarves and vests and all sorts of things. And I stand before you as a free man without a criminal record because my wife physically stopped me from punching somebody out. <laughs> I was so angry. So I do not have a picture of Constantine's statue. That's one from the internet. But it's important because he is, remember when I said there are only a couple of dates I wanted you to remember? 312 was one of those dates. What happened was that um, the Roman Empire was growing bigger and getting much harder to control. And so it was divided up into four sections and so there were four sort of emperors ruled in a triumvirate which never worked. Constantine's father had gone to try and uh, pacify things in England and uh, he was one of the four rulers. When he came back um, he died. Constantine automatically took his place but there was another emperor, Maxentian, and Maxentian 
figured if he stopped Constantine coming back, then he could control on his own. Get rid of one of the one of the triumvirate. Anyway. So there was a battle. The Battle of Milvian Bridge. That's Milvian Bridge today. Uh, I have no idea what it was like in Constantine's day because the only drawings we have on it was just got bodies and heaped everywhere with blood everywhere. But that's uh, a bridge over the River Tiber, the entry into Rome, and it was there that Maxentian and his armies met Constantine and his armies. And Constantine, as the one coming in, it's always easier to defend a place than to attack it. So Constantine, as the one coming in, was the one who was likely to have problems. Now, we're not too sure of, of what it was. Some say it was a slave, but uh, most people now agree it was a, a dream that Constantine had. And uh, the Greek for Christ is that. And the dream was that he should put the symbol that the Christians use, which is the X and the second letter, put the symbol on his shields. He did. And he won. So he said, all right, obviously there is something in this. And so he became a Christian. How genuine his conversion was, it's questionable. How much understanding he had of things is questionable, and historians love debating about that. But he changed forever the history of the church. By 324, he was the sole emperor, had all the power. He was over 40 before he actually said he was a Christian. And he wasn't baptized till he was on his deathbed. But in the intervening years, he supported the church financially, which we'll talk about in a minute. Supported the church financially. He returned the property that had been confiscated under the uh, persecutions we talked about last week. And he gave privileges to the clergy, including exemption from some taxes. In his Edict of Milan, in 313, he announced a tolerance for Christianity, which stopped persecution of Christians from that time on in the empire. He returned all the property that was confiscated. He basically allowed anybody to worship whoever they wanted to, so it didn't matter if it was Christianity or any other religion, you, you could worship it. But that meant that Christians were back in the good books. Uh, over time, the Christians became the accepted religion of Rome and eventually the legal religion of Rome. He called the First Council of Nicaea in 325, which produced the Nicene Creed, which we still use in our churches. He built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, on the supposed site of Jesus' tomb. He built Old St. Peter's Basilica, Old St. Peter's Basilica on the supposed site of St. Peter's resting place. Uh, he legislated in 321 for Sunday as a day of rest for all Christians. Not the Sabbath, but Sunday, the day of the God of the Sun. And December the 25th became Christmas Day. That's the birthday of the Sun, as in S-U-N in pagan religion, which was taken over into uh, Christianity. December the 17th to the 21st was the festival of Saturnalia. Uh, merriment, gift-giving, candles. Any idea where we get most of our Christmas celebrations from? Uh, it's all pagan, taken over by the Christians. A new calendar, Julian calendar, solar calendar, and he was keen to provide stability, and so as Christianity became the key religion of the empire, 
He encouraged councils to be held, which brought um, clergy bishops together to determine doctrine to ensure orthodoxy. So they decreed what was orthodox and uh, got rid of anything that wasn't orthodox, or at least they tried to. Um, the council, oh, all right. Um, he, uh, he destroyed the Donatists from North Africa, was an issue over who was to ordain and so on. Confiscated their church property, sent the clergy into exile, so he wasn't quite as nice as uh, sort of he sounds. The Council of Nicaea was summoned in 325, and it's very important. The Nicaean Creed deals with the heresy of Arianism. Um, Arius was a heretic who taught that Jesus was created by God. So he was inferior to God. And you'll remember from last week, that's the, the Gnostic heresy sort of thing. So Jesus is created by God. And the Nicene Creed says, Jesus is of one essence with God. Now, the one essence in Greek is homoousios, and it was Constantine who recommended that to the council. He probably didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Probably one of his theological advisors told him to do it, but that's what he did, and that's become the key to understanding Jesus is of one essence with God. It's the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all being one. Uh, what else? Well, he presided over the critical session of the council, so he really took an interest in it. He mandated a uniform date for Easter. There were two dates for Easter, as there are now in the East and the West. He mandated one date for Easter. And the councils, at his request, produced a whole lot of early canon law or church law. The other big thing, or two big things he did in terms of, of the secular world, he built the imperial palace at Byzantium, which has become Constantinople, is now Istanbul. So the emperor lived at Constantinople, not in Rome, which changes everything. And he also instituted um, dynastic succession. So the emperor's son becomes the new emperor, uh, which has strengths and obviously weaknesses if you look at English history and some of the kings and queens we were lumbered with down through history. Now at this time they looked at pagan customs and they rejected some and kept some. Oh, okay, we'll do that first. This is, this is 600, so we're going to come back to this. The Roman Empire, which was all around here, um, is under attack from here. Now, obviously, they're not going to attack the east, they're going to attack the west. So it's Christianity in the west that comes under attack. So as we go through some of these things, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, some were rejected candles, incense, and garlands. You know, things you wear around your neck. They were uh, rejected. Good. No, because they came back in a little while. It's all right. And they're back today. But, but they, they were rejected, at least at this stage. The Virgin Mary became more important, and that's probably based on the uh, goddess Diana from the Greek, or the goddess Isis from the Egyptian. There was the cult of, of saints and martyrs, so you collected, I'm sure this is up there, you collected relics, and you worshipped them. No? Okay. Um, Relics were, um, for example, Paul's, a bone from Paul's arm. It was very important and you worshipped it and then later on you paid money to come and see it. Um, if all the bones from Paul's arm are legitimate, Paul was about 18 <laughs> feet tall. Uh, I have seen a bone from John the Baptist's arm. I don't know how tall he was. Uh, I saw that in the same place as I saw Muhammad's whiskers. <laughs> and people take this seriously. <laughs> when you see the 
the bone of John the Baptist's arm and you see Muhammad's whiskers, you uh, have to be silent and there is somebody up in a, in a thing chanting the Quran uh, as you sidle around, sidle around in great respect looking at these wonderful things. Well, that was important. And it still goes on um, in, in Europe uh, when we were visiting various places. You know, there were the, the original uh, <coughs> communion cups from the, the Last Supper uh, and, and all sorts of other wonderful things. And people pay a fortune to go and see them, which means I've never seen them. But, uh, <laughs> but I, saw, I saw John the Baptist's arm and Muhammad's whiskers because I really didn't want to see the harem at the palace, <laughs> but that's another matter. Um, and you had to go through the museum to get to that, but that's, yeah. Um, saints, there were saints to cure barrenness, saints to protect travellers, saints to detect perjury, saints to foretell the future, saints to heal the sick. They were not to be worshipped, that came later, but again it's the Gnostic idea, they are in a special place able to present your petitions to God. Uh, they're closer to him than you, therefore they are important. They become more important as time goes on. The problem with establishment. Now, it, 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 on the surface it seems great. We're now the official church of the Roman Empire, so we're not going to be persecuted. And not only that, we get government handouts. The problem is, all of that leads to weakness, flabbiness, you know, if you're not fighting, uh, then you grow soft, and corruption. And as we'll see, as we go on, more and more the church officials take over the secular role and create all sorts of problems for the church. You can't have the church and the government too closely aligned. Because the moment something goes wrong in the government, the church cops it. You know, imagine, imagine that we said we are aligned to the federal Labor government. 50% of people would be against us straight away. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't tie yourself to that. Remember when um, John Howard made uh, Peter Hollingsworth, the Archbishop of Brisbane, the Governor General. Uh, great move! Until, of course, he was sort of um, had up for not passing on information about child abuse and that sort of thing. And then suddenly the church looked really weak. It was bad enough the child abuse stories, but when the Governor General's involved, who was the Archbishop of, Can of, of uh, Brisbane, everybody wants to put it on the church. So establishment is not as good as it seems to be. The church in England is established. The Anglican Church in Australia has never been established. We were never the official religion of the colony. Uh, we acted that way, and, and some of the early governors acted that way. They wouldn't let other, uh, they wouldn't let Roman Catholic priests who came over uh, as convicts celebrate services and so on. But we were never the established religion. We never had any legal uh, ability to do that. All right, let's move on to a couple of key figures that we need to mention. Athanasius, first of all, 296 to 373. He was one of the giants of theology because he defined the Trinity. Uh, now, you know, the Trinity is a key doctrine, but it doesn't really get defined until the 4th century. And the Trinity is about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being equal, being one. But it's very important because if any of the three is subservient to any of the others of the three, then most of our theology breaks down. So Athanasius is one of the giants because he defined that. His statement was, Christ was made man, that we might be made divine. The idea is that if Jesus wasn't man, whilst he was equal with God, then we couldn't have got to heaven, because the cross wouldn't have worked. 
So Jesus has to be both God and man. And Athanasius teased out the meaning of that in a way that uh, was improved on by Augustine and others, but is still brilliant. If Christ is less than God, he cannot be our saviour. Right? So if, if, if Jesus is divine alone, <coughs> then he can't sin. And if he can't sin, then his death on the cross is a waste of time. If he is human, he can't not sin. Therefore, his death on the cross is to pay for his own sin. But if he is both divine and human, then he is able to sin, but he is able to prevent himself from sinning. Therefore, he goes to the cross um, himself blameless, and he's therefore able to die in our place. Now, read Athanasius, You'll, it'll take you a couple of books to get to that point, but that's a simple explanation of what he's saying. Right? Jesus has to be both God and man, or the cross doesn't work. Go back to the 4th century for Athanasius to get that. He enthusiastic, enthusiastically supported monasticism, which becomes a problem later on. He also introduced the devotional use of the Psalms which Christians have used ever since. Uh, if you use the old Book of Common Prayer, it has in the front of it a lectionary of daily readings. Um, and the idea is that Christians would go to church morning and night every day of the week. That's, you know, they didn't have Bible studies and things like that. You went to church on the way to work, on the way home from work. And by doing that, using the lectionary, you read through the Old Testament once a year. You read through the New Testament four times a year. And you read through the Psalms once a month. And they were seen, the Psalms were seen as the, 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 uh, the devotions of Christians. And later on, of course, when people sang, they didn't sing hymns, they sang Psalms. So he introduced the importance of the Psalms for devotional use, which the church still does today. The second person is Ambrose. Um, the emperors Gratian and Theodosius, and I know there's an overlap, but that's what happens with emperors. They support orthodoxy, uh, they outlaw heresy and paganism, but they do that, do that largely because of Ambrose. He is very influential in getting the emperors <coughs> to do all sorts of things that favour the Christians. He's an interesting bishop. People poured into the Milan Cathedral in uh, 373 to elect a bishop. And a mob. And uh, Ambrose stands up, he says, oh, nobody, he's just one of the mob, but he stands up, oh, I'll take it easy, you know, calm down, take it easy, take it easy, controlling the crowd. And a voice, they say, a little girl's voice, calls out, Ambrose the bishop. <laughs> and they elected him. He wasn't baptised. He hadn't studied any theology. But he became the bishop. And he was a good bishop. Now, I'm not suggesting we do that today, because I don't think we'd necessarily get a good bishop if we did that. But it worked in Ambrose's case. He became a bishop, and a very good bishop. Um, he read Greek theology Wide, widely. Uh, he, uh, he held the position of bishop, by the way, for 23 years. He was the first bishop to coerce the civil rulers. Very important, because later, the bishops come to control the civil rulers, but he's the first one to actually coerce them. He influenced Augustine, Augustine, who we'll look at in a minute, who is one of the towering figures of, of church history. He actually baptised him in Milan. And he introduced a form of hymn singing. It didn't take off in most places, but uh, he even wrote. He even had hymns that Ambrose, Ambrose wrote. Uh, they would have not have been sung, but chanted probably, probably. And most churches went back to chanting the Psalms. I mean, hymn singing is a modern thing. Um, in the English church, it, it dates back to Isaac Watts, what in the early 18th century, late 17th century. Uh, 
And the story is, and in church, they chant the Psalms. And Isaac Watts, as a young man, said to his father, who was the rector, uh, this is hopeless. This is even worse than our 8 a.m. No, can't say um, This is hopeless. And so uh, his father, very wisely, said to him, well, if you think you can do better, do it. And out of that we got, when I said, way the wondrous cross and other great hymns, he's the father of English hymnody. But even then it didn't take on in a lot of places. There are a lot of places where uh, they still chanted the Psalms. And there were churches. Uh, when I was younger doing uh, Scripture Union missions, I can remember staying with a couple who were from the Free Presbyterian Church. There's only two or three of them, I don't know whether it's still even there. Uh, and in their service they only chanted the Psalms. There were no hymns. And they chanted them without musical accompaniment. Uh, they sat down to do that and they stood to pray. And it was really weird. But they let me preach and that's all that mattered. I put up with anything to preach. Um, the big thing that he asked was, what is the emperor to do with the church? In other words, the emperor is inferior to the church. The emperor is not above the church, he's part of the church. And you can see in that statement, he's building up the idea that bishops have a great deal of power until eventually they do. All right, well now, move on a century. What's the story of worship at the end of the fourth century? We've been looking at, at uh, each century as we go through. There is an increase in formalism, doing the same thing week by week, and that allows heresy to develop, because once you formalise something, it becomes ritual, and eventually nobody stops to question them. And so formalism is uh, a good thing in some ways, a bad thing in other ways. The main festivals were only Easter, which is only the Sunday, and Pentecost, and the services were usually in Greek, because that was the language of the people. It was extemporary, bishop prays uh, and preaches as the Spirit leads him, but there are some things that have become part of the formula of worship. Uh, do you remember, do you recognise? Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. That's in these services. But it ain't original, it's in the Jewish services, that's where it comes from. But they've taken those and formalised them. Uh, holy, holy, holy. Well, you know, it's there. And using the Jewish customs, they put doxologies at the end of prayer. See, if you've got an extemporary prayer, nobody else can pray it with you. We just say amen at the end, but they had a doxology at the end. This was the Jewish way of doing it. Um, so, our Father, who art in heaven, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. That's a doxology. That's not part of Jesus' prayer. That's the Jewish ending. And when the uh, authorised version is produced and when the, the uh, Book of Common Prayer is produced, that's included. Because it's assumed when Jesus had prayed like that, you added that ending because that was what the church did. Now because it wasn't part of the original, very interesting, in uh, 1978 when the first of the revised prayer books came out, um, they dropped the doxology at the end because uh, Don Robbie and others who were tr doing the prayer book said, you know, we really, we really ought to be like everybody else. And the Catholic Church didn't have that. At precisely the time we dropped it, the Catholic Church added it, <laughs> so they wouldn't be different. <laughs> so you can't win whatever you do, all right? <laughs> but that's what that means. There are doxologies at the end of prayers. They said the creeds, the creeds become a, a, a fixed part of worship. There was a set form of words of baptism, And then, as the century progressed, written liturgies came into being. Um, written liturgies of the type we have now. That was a very slow process. Church on Sunday was usually 
before or at dawn. All right, so those who couldn't make it at 7.30 wanted to move to 8. And those who can't make it at 8, they have to come at 10 because 8's too early. Well, back in those days, you would have to be there at dawn. <laughs> then again, it was a different world, I suppose. Now, the things that had been rejected in the 3rd century are now accepted in the 4th century. So, candles, incense, uh, they come back in. And also they add curtaining around the, the supposed altar. Uh, this, is, this is the idea of the Jewish tabernacle where, where the curtain goes around and you have the Holy of Holies in the temple, for example. Uh, and so they do that, which is another bit of secret, secrecy. Remember I said last week, uh, anybody who wasn't a Christian was kicked out of the service before they have communion. Which is why the heresies develop, or sorry, the persecutions develop. Christians are cannibals, because they're eating flesh. Uh, and they're immoral, because it's called a love feast. You know, they kick us out, shut the doors, and then they have an orgy. And nobody can tell any difference, but you get kicked out. Put a, a, a curtain around what the priest is doing, it becomes even more secret, even more holy, even more special. And leads to all sorts of heresies. And before you criticise them, we put glass, stained glass windows in some people can't see what we're doing. Just <laughs> um, the church here started to develop following the life of Christ. And Easter moved from being just Sunday to being a week-long festival. Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Day, and then the uh, people who were being baptised were prepared during the 40 days of Lent, and then for the week after Easter, that was when they had full-time um, tuition. 336 is the first mention of Christmas. In the West, it's on the day of the sun, the birthday of the sun, December the 25th. Uh, in the East, it's January the 6th and then they merged uh, by the end of the 4th century to December the 25th. Rome begins to try and endorse uniformity. Gradually, Saints' Day has become uh, their part of it, and, and they grow in number. Uh, and you have the main saints, you have local saints, uh, the elevation of Mary is even greater now. Um, the services, Greek is replaced by Latin. Service books are produced. They're only for the clergy because the people don't understand Latin. And Greek is a language, but, but now it's Latin. It's all designed to make the church more and more mysterious. And when that happens, you see, you, you separate the priestly class who understand what's going on from the laity who haven't got a clue what's going on. And that gap grows bigger and bigger because Latin becomes the language of the service. Service books, lectionaries um, are produced there are books of sermons called homilies produced for those uh, priests who are not able to prepare their own sermons, particularly in, in Latin. And so they get these books of homilies and they simply read them. In the Reformation in England, uh, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, produced two books of homilies because you see a lot of the clergy were uneducated and had come from Catholicism into, into the Reformed faith, they couldn't preach sermons because they'd never had to. And so the books of homilies are written and they produce some of the best theological writing you could ever hope to read. Brilliant! Um, there are also some of what women can wear to church and so on that really aren't so good. But uh, justification by faith and other things, they are just absolutely brilliant but very hard to read because they were written in the um, 16th century. Believer's baptism is replaced by infant baptism. Now, the two go together. 
Infant baptism is based on uh, the idea of the covenant. God makes a covenant with you and your children. In uh, Acts, remember Paul and Silas in prison. The jailer who, who gets converted, they take him out and they baptise him and his family, which we assume is his wife and his children. They had no time for any instruction. And so based on that, infant baptism comes in. But in this age, infant baptism takes over as the standard. And we're not going to have any debates on baptism, not even in modern church history. We just bypass that for the moment. Um, and even, even because of the, the infant mortality, a, a midwife can baptise a baby. Where this <laughs> um, Daily services were introduced because of the development of monasticism. So church wasn't just on Sunday, now church was available every day. Uh, which reformers made great use of. Ordination used to just be a service at the end of communion. Now it becomes a special service. The laying on of hands, the presentation of, uh, of articles that represent the role, just as we do it here, um, all makes ordination far more significant. You see what's happening? It's the cult of the priesthood. We are becoming more and more and more and the light is becoming less and less and less important. You may have to cut this out, John, but um, last, <laughs> last week <coughs> Alex wrote to John and I and said, would you like to be parish nominators? We can't find anything against it. And I wrote back and said, sure, I'm happy to press the boundaries. That will come as a surprise to you, won't it? <laughs> uh, and then Grant read the ordinances and discovered that really you had to be a lay person. And uh, so I wrote back to Alex and said, you, you just don't understand, do you, that uh, we clergy can't do it because when lay hands were laid on us, the magic that was imparted made us so much superior to all those ordinary lay people that we can't do it. And he just wrote back and said, I'm not a very good Anglican, am I? But anyway, <laughs> you have to understand these things. We can't sit on synod, we can't be parish representative or anything like that because we are now different. We're clergy. We are different. Well, that comes from these days. And it becomes a real problem, of course. Churches were now being built um, based on the Roman design and the Roman hall. Um, and it has an axe at the front. Sorry, it should be a head. Very simple design, that's where stuff happens and the people are down here, uh, not with seats or anything like that. But of, of course, we're Christians, um, we can't do anything properly, can we? We really, you know, you can't possibly just have something simple like that. So churches get more and more glorious and more and more special until they reach the height of, of the Saint of Sophia in Constantinople or Istanbul. It is now, of course, a, a Muslim mosque, but still the original church. That's what it's like inside. Uh, it's magnificent. Absolutely magnificent. I have no idea what it costs for upkeep, but anyway. Uh, but that is, that is the great church. That's maybe probably the, the experts say the greatest church ever built. All right, Augustine, uh, we'll, we'll finish this and then we'll, I'll let you have a few more minutes break this first time. Sorry, Leo the Great, we'll start with him. Leo the Great was a bishop of Rome in 440. He's the one who pushes the primacy of Rome over Constantinople. Now, we'll, we'll do a little bit more of that next week. He's the first to make use of Matthew 16, 19. You are Peter, on this rock I build my church, as the justification for the papacy. Right? So we, we are looking at 440 before anybody thinks to make that verse from Matthew a justification for having a pope. So anybody that wants to convince you this is, uh, goes back to a New Testament thing, no, it doesn't. It obviously doesn't. 
He fought against the divinity of Christ taking precedence over the humanity. He actually taught that Christ was fully human and fully divine. Very important, as I've explained. But he began to have a huge amount of civil influence. And we'll talk more about some of the other things he did next week because they fit in better with what we're going to do next week. He convinces Attila the Hun to turn back from his uh, attack on Rome. And because he's the one who talked him out of it, not the emperor, he's the one who gets all the glory. And then when the, uh, when, when the vandals attack Rome, he is able to limit the damage by the way that he deals with them. And that is very, very important. And so he starts to take on a role as the Pope that usurps the role of the Emperor. Begins there and it goes on to get worse in the Middle Ages. Let's pause before we get to uh, Augustine. We'll start with him after we've had a cup of coffee and I have a brief rest. <laughs> prior to the Reformation, and he has a big influence on the Reformation. He is uh, one of the absolute greats. He was born in North Africa in 354, <coughs> and he learned his Christianity from his mother. His mother's a wonderful. Uh, he actually quit Christianity mm -hmm. for a little while, uh, because he thought the Old Testament was barbaric. And he enjoyed the pleasures of the flesh. Um, if you're the sort that likes reading dirty books, you can buy the Confessions of Augustine. People think you're really holy, but let me tell you, they're holy. Uh, he was quite a man. But Ambrose, uh, who we just talked about, showed him that uh, Christianity was, was actually intellectual and uh, he uh, actually, Augustine went away to think about it and he was converted by the strangest verses that they're based on his background. Um, I would never read these to somebody and say you need to become a Christian. In Romans chapter 13, um, Verses 13 and 14. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And he read that and he thought, wow, I'm a bad boy. I'm going to become a good boy. <laughs> He became a Christian. In 396, he became the Bishop of Hippo. Um, he's a Hippo. Um, Hippo is down here somewhere. Um, I think one of the great things he said, nobody else does, he said, believe in order to understand. Now most of us will take the approach, when you know what it's about, you are likely to come to faith and believe. He said, believe in order to understand. Now, moderns don't like that because what that means is that you actually go into your studies with a bias. Your belief determines how you look at everything. And so your understanding becomes, understanding becomes a biblical understanding. 
he taught using Jesus' parable that the church is made up of wheat and tares. Now, the monastic orders came into being because the church had become unholy. Now, anybody can come to church. And we don't want them there. They're lowering the tone. And so we go out into a monastery, you know, where we can actually keep others out and we can make it holy. Augustine said, no, 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 no. The church is made up of wheat and tears, and it's not your job to determine who belongs and who doesn't. God will judge them. And he talked about the heavenly kingdom, uh, the city of God. It's what you're aiming for where it'll only be the weak. But until God sifts it through, you have to put up with it. And that's very important for us to understand because a lot of the things that we do in our churches actually put off people who come from outside. Uh, I mean, if you, if you come into a traditional Anglican service off the street with very good background, you wonder what on earth is going on? These weird people up the front in fancy dress, using ancient language and saying things that, that really don't mean anything anymore. Um, what is happening? So you don't come back. Now what we've got to do is somehow find a way to do those things that we enjoy, that we think are meaningful, but also to attract others. Now in some places they do it in this way. They have a, a conventional service at 8 a.m. which is straight prayer. And at 10 a.m. they have something for the family. So they have a children's talk and all that sort of thing. And then at night they have something for teenagers. You know, with wild music and all that sort of thing. So they're actually tailoring the church service to meet the needs of those who come. Uh, we have got to do a lot better at meeting the needs of non-Christians in our services without upsetting the Christians too much. Augustine taught, you're going to have to put up with people in the church who are not as committed as you are. Get used to it. Because the church is made up of wheat and tears. He then taught that the sacraments come from Christ and therefore if the priest is unworthy, it doesn't negate the sacrament. Now that's the anchor position. That's in the, 40, the, the, the 39 articles. We said the 42 articles because they're the better ones. But the 39 articles that we have in our prayer book, um, that's an article. If the priest is, is not worthy, the sacrament still stands. That's Augustine. He came up with that. Now that's very important. Infant baptism became the sin. That became the norm. He taught the fall and original sin. Well, oh, that's not popular today. The fall. People actually, Adam and Eve, fell from grace. And from that time on, everybody was born in sin. Now, from the, uh, from the, the late 18th century on, the rationalists, they said everybody is born good and then they're corrupted as they grow older. And if they're born good, then it should be possible to get back to that. And that's the, um, the survival of the fittest in the animal kingdom becomes a social theory. That gradually, you can... Um, get back to that. It's, it's the basis of, of uh, Hitler's super race. Same sort of thing. You begin with good, things go wrong, so what you got to do is change that. Augustine taught, as the Bible teaching, you were born sinful. And the only solution is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, yeah, you all heard all that before, but this is revolutionary when Augustine says it. Revolution. Um, the necessity of grace um, as part of free will in turning to God, the, the uh, Arian controversy, and, and it's a huge thing, you know, 
predestination free will, big issue. We'll maybe mention it next term when we do Wesley and Whitfield. But um, he says, there's a lot of, you know, Arianism, free will, you choose. He says there's a man of his grace in that. And God's part of it. It's not just up to you. God is the one who causes it. Um, and we we'll talk about that more next term. He believes in the predestination of the elect. God will get into the kingdom, those that he wants there. And to endure the world and seek the peace of the heavenly city. That's Augustine. That's Dennis McCauley, Sunday after Sunday. Remember he's saying, doesn't matter what happens to you in this life, the crown of glory is coming. That's Augustine. That's what he taught. You endure this world because you will one day get to the heavenly city. And that's important. All right, the fall of the Roman Empire occurs around this time. Uh, that, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. I'll be honest, I've never read it. But there is a one volume, you know, Reader's Digest Condensed Version, that's actually more scholarly than that. I, I've read parts of the one volume, one, but there's no overtake to that, no matter how good a historian I am. Um, Gibbon is, is anti-Christian, but he gives a whole lot of reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire. Some of them are wrong. I mean, the basic fall of the Roman Empire was because the barbarians came from up in these areas and attacked. The barbarians are all of those who don't have the sophistication of Rome, of the Roman Empire. Uh, it's possible to look at the modern church in terms of the Roman Empire and say, look, the barbarians are still coming. Uh, when I was in college, I remember a sermon by Carl Henry, who was an American um, professor of, of religious ethics more than anything else. He's a founder of the magazine Christianity Today. But I remember his sermon in which he, he, he took a Bible verse and then he looked at what society was saying and it ended with, the barbarians are coming. And then he'd go to another verse, oh, the barbarians are coming. And uh, anyway, the real reason for that, that fall was that the barbarians came. But there are reasons that aren't legitimate uh, that are put forward. Uh, press the right button there, so that Climate change. You thought that was new, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Fourth century was far hotter than the climate is today, uh, as were the Middle Ages. And uh, there are those, and uh, Gibbon said, you know, it was actually the heating up that that, that caused the problem. Uh, uh, you know, you can blame the emperor, he didn't have enough carbon neutral chariots, <laughs> and he didn't put enough nappies on his horses so he could fight into the atmosphere. <laughs> It's all rubbish. Didn't cause the Roman Empire to fall. And I know there are people here who probably believe in it, but it's the same today. Uh, I went. I I graduated from school 61 years ago. We were taught that the Earth was heading for a new ice age. That's what we were taught. And then I studied climatology at university, and they said, no, no, that's not true. You can't predict anything without 500 years of climate data, which we simply don't have. And uh, we were taught there are cycles. The Earth was hotter in plenty of times BC. It was hotter uh, at the fall of the Roman Empire. It was hotter uh, at, in the Middle Ages, and it's getting hotter again now. And um, anyway, it didn't fall because of climate change. Soil exhaustion, the idea that uh, the Roman Empire had become so populous that uh, uh, the soil was giving out and they couldn't find enough food. No. Uh, in the late 18th century, there was an economist, Thomas Malthus, who taught that the population would grow by geometric progression and the food supply would grow by arameth, arameth, whatever. Which means the population would grow 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 
and the food supply would go 2468 until eventually we'd all starve to death. Didn't happen. Uh, great theory at the time. Uh, he was an economist, he also wrote from Reverend Thomas Mosses. You find new ways. The world didn't start. Race mixture. There you go. There's a Nazi solution. You can't have multiculturalism. It weakens everybody. You've got to have a pure Aryan race. So, no, it had nothing to do with the fact that the Roman Empire became mixed race. That wasn't the issue at all. And immorality. Well, yes, Rome was the centre of some of the great immorality of all time. But uh, it didn't cause the fall of the Roman Empire. So what did, did cause the fall? I hate to tell you this because actually it's been uncomfortable. Failure of human and material resources. Too many non-productive members of society and not enough productive members. Does that sound modern? Yeah. All of us oldies are just a drag on the community. And the young ones aren't working because they're on the doll and all that sort of stuff. You know. But it's a problem, and it was a problem for Rome because what had happened was that the army had doubled in size since the third century. The army is unproductive. It's doubled in size, it's also a lot more inefficient too. Bureaucracy increased. Never happens now, does it? <laughs> you get elected to Parliament as a tool and suddenly you want a dozen staffers in your office. In the old days you had one staff. You say tool or tool? Tool. tool. <laughs> Come on, yeah, we won't go into politics, but but yeah, they were the ones who asked for all these extra staff because they had so much to do. Um, and there's a court case because one of them thought you had to work too hard. And she, here. Um, bureaucracy expands, happens everywhere. I could make some comments about what happens up in Newcastle, but John would just have to cut them out, so I won't. But you know, you know what I'm talking about. Bureaucracy has become big. And the other thing is, a few people had a disproportionate share of the wealth. Doesn't happen now, does it? Nah. These were a real reason for the downfall of the Roman Empire. The West was weaker, as I pointed out, over the attacks from the Germanic states. Gibbon says the Christians have a part to play in it. Christians are partially responsible, and he gives two reasons for that. The first is you got all these clergy and monks who are not productive. <coughs> but the second reason is the Christians have this weird idea that the barbarians are part of God's judgment on the immorality of the Roman Empire, and therefore they welcome them with open arms. So the Christians are to blame. But the fall of the Roman Empire changes the world and changes the church because the church is tied intimately with the Roman Empire. Now, after the fall of the Roman Empire, it's the church that actually takes Roman culture to the world. It's the church that epitomizes everything that is good in the Roman Empire and takes on and helps the barbarian to become better. All right, churches in the 4th and 5th century. Numbers increased after Constantine. Stop persecution. It's much easier to be part of the church. But now things happen. The bishop is no longer the head of a congregation, but the head of a number of congregations. Now you see, once upon a time, the bishop was the head of the church, of a local church. Now we've got so many local churches and instead of calling the, the head person the bishop, you call him something else, a rector or whatever. And the bishop now becomes the head of a number of churches.
and here's where problems arise. Bishop is a key person in the life of all the churches. So the bishop is central to the life of the church. Or, what well, if you go back to the New Testament where the church is the local congregation? Now, the bishop is the servant of the local church. It's highly different. The bishop now is there to serve the local church. Not to rule over it, but to help it to serve it. You have two entirely competing, competing philosophies. Now, in the 4th and the 5th centuries, the bishop starts to take that central of the You spend five years as a deacon, ten years as a priest, and so you can't become a bishop till you're 45. Um, that gives it a little bit of maturity. In these days, the centralisation is so great that the bishop consecrates the elements and they are taken out to the churches. So the priest, all he does is distribute them. His role has been diminished even further. So if the laity are nobody, it's now the priest is a nobody. And that develops at this time in the worship system. The bishop controls the finances. Churches acquire property. With government endowments, subsidies, bishop controls everything, and that leads to corruption. And so in the end they have to deal with it, and so they, by the end of the 5th century they've worked out that you have to divide all income four ways. There's the bishop, there's the clergy, there's the poor, and there's the repair and lighting of the churches, there's the upkeep on the churches. And they do that to prevent the corruption that was starting to creep in uh, when the bishop controlled everything. And then the, the country clergy, they have a problem, you see, because the bishop can't take stuff out of the country clergy because there's distance and there's no modern communication. And so they, they start to become more and more uh, independent. And the country clergy have developed, the country parishes developed the kind of parish system that we have today uh, because of that. Clergy in the city are rich. Clergy in the country rely on the goodness of the congregation because they don't have much money. Um, okay. Another development. The wealthy landowner builds a church on his property for his workers, but anybody can come to it. Now we've got a problem. Because if he built the church and owns the church, the bishop sort of has no say. And so the wealthy landowner gets to choose who he wants to be the minister. Not the bishop. And if the wealthy end land and doesn't like the person he's chosen, he gets rid of him. <laughs> Not the bishop. And that system is a system that developed down through the Middle Ages and into the, uh, into the Reformed Church. Uh, when I was ordained to the priesthood at our ordination retreat, we had Bible studies taken by an Englishman who was a member of the Church Pastoral Aid Society. Now the Church Pastoral Aid Society is a whole lot of wealthy people who in the 19th century, when landowners were selling up their churches because uh, either they weren't interested or the farms were getting smaller or whatever, the Church Pastoral Aid Society bought up those livings. And so they controlled a whole lot of appointments to churches. And I can say, I don't know why he picked me. I still remember him sitting down over dinner with me and saying, would you come to England? I can promise.
promise that we'll get you to the right parish. We'll talk about it. Uh, you can go as a curate to John Stott or someone like that if you want to, or you can go out to your own parish, a rural or, or a city parish, and fill all these livings and we'll find you a good one. That's the reality of it. I said none um, at that stage, but I watch all these English shows and I look at the church and I think, gee, that would have been a good one. <laughs> It's not the reason you do these things. <laughs> um, so the wealthy landowner actually ends up with a great deal of control over the church, more control than the vision. That creates problems and tensions later. As organisation grows, it's an increasing um, reliance on councils and synods. Uh, councils were generally, I mean, in general terms, the, the whole church synods tend to be more localised, to determine doctrine, to determine um, church law and all that sort of thing. Um, and that, that, they grow up and they, they have an importance at various times. And the big controversy, of course, is who is the leading bishop? Is it Rome or is it Constantinople? And uh, that changes with, with Leo, and we'll talk more about that next week. Next week's lecture by the centre will be about six hours, but that's it. <laughs> um, two very important figures, Jerome, 345 to 420. He was a scholar and he was commissioned by the Pope to make a proper Latin translation of the Bible. Now, there were bits and pieces of the Bible in Latin, but uh, because Latin was the language of the church, the Pope wanted a Latin Bible. And the Bible he produced is called the Vulgate. He, uh, he started on it. He spent 23 years on it. And he went uh, and ended up, he spent a lot of, most of that time, living a monastic life in Bethlehem. And he wrote, not only translated the Bible, he wrote commentaries. And, and part of the, the brilliance of that, not only was he a brilliant language scholar, but he also, because he was in Bethlehem, knew a lot about the Holy Land. And so he understood a lot of the background. He began with the Greek New Testament and the Greek Old Testament. The Greek Old Testament is called the Septuagint. Because the Greek Old Testament includes the books between 400 and the coming of Jesus, the bit that um, where there were no prophets. Because of that, they are still part of the Catholic Church, and in Catholic churches, you will hear things read from um, the apocryphal books in the, in the services, and that remains so to this day. Um, the apocryphal books are interesting. There is some really good stuff in them. There's a lot of good history in them, and there's a whole lot of rubbish in them. Um, they remain important for the Catholic Church because that's the real basis of purgatory that comes up in these books. But then he realised he wasn't really doing the right thing, and so he went back to the Hebrew Old Testament, and his final version, the Vulgate, uh, was translated from Hebrew and Greek, and was very good. And the Council of Trent, which met during the Reformation, affirmed this as the official version of the Bible in 1546. And a lot of later translations of the Bible, certainly in the Catholic Church, are translated from the Vulgate. The RSV, when it came out, there was a common RSV, and that included the Septuagint, that was designed to, for Catholics to buy. Um, but if everything that you teach from the Bible comes from the Bible, you've got a problem. Because you cannot translate one language to another accurately. You, you, you've got a, a dynamic translation, you, you've got to actually um, give and take here and there. You see, we have, we have a very simple language, or we have a very confusing language, actually. The cat 
set on the map. Catch the subject, the object is the map, doing word, the verb is the set. Now if we say cap, sat, map, on, the, it makes no sense at all. It makes no sense at all. In Greek, the word order doesn't matter. Because it's the end of the word, and so on, that tells you the part of speech. So when the word appears, the cat, it's got the subject ending, the map has got the object ending, the verb is there. It's, it's the form of the word that determines what it is. Now sometimes that's not clear, and you've got to work out the order. So that's the first thing. Language structures are entirely different. It's a lot more complex than that, let me tell you. Uh, I don't know how modern students learn Greek because they don't learn grammar at school. I believe learn grammar at school. If you don't understand English grammar, that must be really difficult. But there is another problem in that languages are idiomatic. Word meanings change over time in one language and they change between one language and another. And so if you go from the Greek or the Hebrew to the Latin and then you translate from the Latin, you're going to make, make some errors. Uh, the simplest way to explain it is, is um, back in the early days of computer, there was a computer designed to translate from one language to another. And they had a big unveiling, a parable rule there. And uh, they said, right, now let's feed something into it. Somebody call out and somebody said, um, out of sight, out of mind. Mm. So they typed in out of sight, out of mind in English and they pressed the button for Russian and lights and boiling wheels were and all sorts of things spat out, out of sight, out of mind in Russian. And to make sure it was right, they typed in out of sight, out of mind in Russian and pressed the button for English. And out came invisible idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see the problem? It's difficult to go from one language to another. It's hard enough to go from Greek to English to actually interpose Latin in the middle creates problems. Jerome did us a great service, but not if we continue to rely on that without going back to the original. And the Bibles of the Reformation, the thing that made them so good was that they went back to the language of the original. Um, his commentaries are good, but they were written in a rush. It took him two weeks to write his commentary on Matthew's Gospel. Um, so, you know, yeah. John Chrysostom is a great preacher. He was uh, born in 350 at Antioch, baptized at 18, a deacon at, uh, in 381, a presbyter in 386. He was a great preacher and many of his sermons survived. And the thing about Chrysostom, his great preaching, is his insights into the Bible are brilliant. And so he influences a lot of people, because people read his sermons, uh, hundreds of them survive, and uh, he influenced them. He became a bishop against his will, and there were all sorts of problems, we won't go into that because we don't have time. He was exiled, people demanded he come back and so on. Into the Middle Ages, monasticism. Well, into the Middle Ages, as I said, the, the church became the prime way of, of transmitting Roman culture. Uh, so, um, organization of the church is based on the Roman Senate. Canon law is based on Roman law. Um, Latin gave unity to the Christian world. You know, people spoke all sorts of different languages as Greek had done it back at the beginning, now Latin gives uniformity. And the architecture is all Roman in origin. And the Romans were brilliant, you know. I mean, every time I look at an arch, I think of just how incredible the Romans were, because that's, they, they found out the arch was where you put pressure on it, the arch is the strongest form. And you look at buildings and bridges and so much, it all goes back to the Romans. Well, the church 
carries that on. And that's why we have the dark ages when the church fails, the Roman culture fails, and all of the learning fails, and all that sort of thing. Monasticism began in the late third, early fourth century, based on the idea that the church is lowering its standards. There are people there that we don't want to have anything to do with. We want purity, we want communion with God. So it begins with hermits who to get away people sit on top of poles or sit on mountaintops or whatever else. But eventually it becomes a community thing and with the community you, you've got to feed them so you become self-sufficient and then you discover that you're really good at growing grapes so you make wine and then you sell the wine to people and make money to buy other things and so that many of the monasteries become um, quite big businesses. They're communities of learning but they are primarily communities where people can stop and get close to God. And to do that, they end up, we'll talk next week about the, the hours of the day and all of the services you have to go to and all of that sort of thing. Uh, they were very popular among the Celts. Um, people talked about St. Patrick as how he started the monasteries in Ireland. He didn't, but he uh, was part of it and he did favour asceticism. Clergy was celibate or became celibate eventually. By the, uh, by the, the third century, celibacy was being, seen, was being seen as a mark of holiness. Based on the idea, Paul said, it's better not to be married because you're free to do all sorts of things. But then it became far more significant. In the fourth century, there were moves to prevent marriage after ordination. And that grew stronger as the fourth century wore on. <clears throat> when does sin, sin enter into you? To conception. Therefore, the act of intercourse must be, must be sinful. Therefore, you shouldn't do it. Therefore, you clergy who need to be holy, you've got to be subtle. That's the sort of thing. And, of course, it leads to clergy <laughs> living with women without marrying them. Or, I think, just as bad clergy deserting their wives when they get ordained um, because they are to be married. But it became eventually the way to go. The East allowed you to marry before ordination. The bishops had to be celibate, whereas in the West there was pressure for complete celibacy. And it was legally enforced by Pope Gregory the Eighth, Seventh, Pope Gregory the Seventh, in 1070 to 1080. Alright, so when people tell you no celibacy has always been the way that you know that. It's um, the end of the, of the 11th century that it really comes in. I suppose we ought to talk about Patrick, wouldn't we? Because it was his day the other day. to 461. I'm only going to tell you a few things about him because guess what? Most of what you hear about him is myth and legend. I don't know whether it's true or not. He was born in Britain at the age of 16. He was seized by raiders and taken to Ireland. Spent six years as a slave then returned home. Uh, returned to Ireland as a bishop in 432 and spent 30 years ministering there. Um, Irish Christianity is based on the abbot, not the bishop. The abbot of the monastery is more important than the bishop. All the rest is legend. I know you'd be disappointed about that, but it is. It's legend. I remember in Ireland being told all the legends and the Irishmen with a grin saying, uh, you can believe it if you want it. Um, we don't know anything else. Now, I was going to talk about England. But I'm going to leave that to next week and, and do a, a much broader. Um, I was only going to talk about the beginnings of Christianity in England. So let me finish with, with Islam, the start of Islam, because um, this is going to next week become one of the big issues. Muhammad was born about 561, he died 632. As a young man, he thought, wouldn't it be good if we could get Judaism and Christianity? Zoroastrianism, which is a religion of Persia, 
all together as one religion. And so he actually worked on it, put it together, uh, went to the Jews, they laughed at him, they said, So he went away in disgust. Then he had a call. Um, and he went up onto a mountain. And up on the mountain, Allah dictated for him the Quran, the Holy War. Which finally is Judaism, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism brought together. I'm sorry to be cynical, but you know, um, it's a little bit, yeah, a little bit too. He was, uh, he told that the, the Quran talks about the impending judgment of the world, reward and punishment for each individual's actions. Allah is God, He's the creator and the judge. There are far five main obligations the confession of faith, there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. You need to pray five times a day, charitable gifts, gifts, fasting in the holy month of Ramadan, and the pilgrimage to Mecca once in your life. The Quran uh, is very hard to read because it's, it's disorganized. It's not organized like the Bible, it's very disorganized um, and it's very hard to read. But it's not all of Islam, but it's what uh, Muhammad produced. Now, I'm cynical about, you know, the Quran being sort of dictated by Allah when it was really stuff that he produced earlier on anyway. But a lot of Christians wanting to put it down find all sorts of other reasons to have a go at him, and I don't think they're reasonable. Uh, one of the big criticisms is he married a much older woman, and so this is oh, horrible. But it's not really. Um, it's hardly a reason to criticise him. And, uh, um, American, so there are American Indian tribes where the tradition is that an older woman marries a younger man. She teaches him not only sex, but she teaches him the, the traditions. She dies because she's older. He's now older. He marries a younger woman and teaches her the tradition. He dies, she's old, she married a younger man, and that's how they keep the vision. Now, it's, it's nothing to criticise him for, so you've got to be a little bit careful with some of that we can get wrapped up in that. We really ought to be criticising the ideas, not the man. There are other things, the uh, hadith, which was put together later, it's the sayings um, and habits of the prophet. The ijma, ijma, or whatever, the body of law followed by the faithful, <coughs> and then the jihad, hold war, um, designed to defend Islam against attack. Now, in the Quran, holy war allows you to use whatever force you need to defend Islam against attack, and it's always been seen as a physical thing. If somebody attacks Islam, you can fight back. Uh, we'll talk next week about the Crusades, one of the, the really bad periods in Christian history. But the the, um, the Muslims were able to fight back because jihad allowed it. That changed in the 1950s and 60s with a guy called Sayyid Qutba. And whenever they talk about modern terrorism, they don't talk about him because he's a man. Sayyid Cooper was an Egyptian who went to America and actually went to some church functions, some Christian church functions. He went to one where there was a dinner and a woman came on to him. She thought it was horrible. Uh, you know, we won't talk about his sexuality, but he thought that was bad. And so he sat down and started to thought about it, think about it. And he said, worse than an attack by an army is an attack by a culture. And so you see our young people are watching American films and American television and that's a cultural attack. And Islam is being destroyed by culture. 
Therefore, you have to attack the culture because it's attacking us. That's the justification for the Twin Towers and all of the other acts of terrorism. American culture is bad because it will undermine Islam if it gets in, so you've got to destroy it. And that changes the whole thing. So you need to understand that our modern view of Islam uh, and the terrorism associated with it is a modern view. Cooper died in the 1960s. He actually was um, hanged, I think he was hanged, for uh, uh, trying to assassinate President Nasser of Egypt. But those modern views of terrorism are only as old as 60 years ago. They're not part of the original thinking. Now that's going to form a, a little bit of a play next week because it has a big effect on the church. Next week, we're going from 600 to 1500. <laughs> Get ready for a ride. But most of the things that we have, that we need to know that have caused problems for today We've now dealt with. And so we're going to look at how uh, the church, because of the things we've looked at, declines and goes into uh, almost paganism, corruption, and all of those things. Interestingly, it's not all bad. There are people all the way through who keep trying to bring it back to, to, to the Bible. And then we'll see, just prior to the Reformation, how a whole lot of people do that. They're not reformers, not by any way, but they actually start to question what's going on, which sets up the Reformation of the 16th century. So that's next week. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. That's right. Thank you.